Uh, but for tonight, it is Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Uh, put a title on tonight's message of uh, Beware of a Little Foolishness. And most likely you already have a title in your, your Bible over that section that talks about folly and so forth. And so uh, beware of a little foolishness. Verse number one, it says, dead, fu- dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a, a foul odor. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. Father, we look to you now. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and our ears and give us hearts to hear. And uh, we pray that you would be working amongst us. And I pray, Father, and ask that you would impart to me just a a special bestowment of your spirit now as I teach your word. I ask this by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, being aware of a a little foolishness or being aware of a little folly, as uh, we're going to see here in verse number one, uh, we know that... You know, for 2018 and all the advancement of technology that is going on that, uh, you know, if you're watching the news articles and you're watching on social media and you're watching on television, uh, man, all the advancements of AI, artificial intelligence is going crazy. It's all over the place. And, uh, you know, even as you, as you watch, uh, I'm a LinkedIn member, so I watch, uh, you know, I see some of the news, the daily rundown that comes through LinkedIn and all that <laughs> stuff, talking about the job sector in this and the amount of people the amount of jobs that are open within our uh, within our country right now is just absolutely crazy from the trucking industry all the way around to the fast food industry and really quite frankly everything else there in between that there is there's vacancies that haven't been this way and I understand somewhere seven ten years maybe a little more um, but 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 the amount of vacancies they're talking about filling these vacancies with artificial intelligence. So we live in an era of time here that has so many benefits and so many conveniences that the days that have gone by, the people haven't had what we've had. And yet in the middle of all of these conveniences, what still happens? We still find a way, yes, we take advantage of the conveniences, but we still find a way to be overwhelmed and overburdened and too busy for our own good. And it leaves us in a place where, you know, uh, you know, some of you are a little bit older, you know, maybe you guys remember the blue light special at Kmart. It was a big thing, uh, at least when I was little it was. But, uh, you know, maybe we have the uh, mesmerizing aspects of blue light now from the conveniences of just portable technology. And we're always remaining in this place, even before bed, you know, we're, we're right there. At least I am. I'm guilty of this. You know, I'm always on that stupid phone of mine and... Uh, I wish I could tell you it was always for, you know, something important. Most of the time, it's not. Um, but but we, we always have something there where we feel that stress factor and our little minds are still going and going and going and going, and, you know, and, 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 and we go to sleep with this thing in our hand. I don't know if you've ever done this, but I've fallen asleep like this, so I hold, laying in bed and holding my phone. And <laughs> it's, you laugh, so some of you else have done it too. <laughs> That's probably sick, so... <laughs> Man, uh, but we're, you know, again, we always have this bombardment of stuff that is going on. And so, you know, it, whether it's, this was in Solomon's time or we look to our own time, which is more easier to relate to, is that people enjoy stepping out and, uh, you know, escaping from reality. They, 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 they enjoy moving to a place of embracing a little bit of folly, a little bit of foolishness. Let's test that thought, Okay. Play, play along with this, okay? When I pause, you respond. What happens in Vegas, in Vegas? How in the world did all of you guys know that? <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? You know, or it's like culturally accepted to embrace a little bit of foolishness here. Hey, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm not sure that we want to unpackage exactly all that that means here in church, but uh, point being is, is, is that it seems like Embracing a little bit of folly is, is more common than we care to admit. And so Solomon, after all of his explorations, after every bit of indulgences that he's gone through in these, these past 10 chapters here, as he's told us, you know, 
I guess entering chapter 10 now, but, but as, as we've gotten to this point, he's, we've seen his battle going back and forth, the things that he's wrestled with, the things, the, you know, his, his, his hypothesis that he's put forth and all of this stuff. And now chapter 10, 11, and 12, we're coming down to the final side and, and he's beginning to work through the summary of all of this stuff. You know, he raised that big question is, is that, you know, what is life all about? And should I be living life and all of these things? And, and what advantage does the person that is alive have over the person that is dead? All of these questions he's asked. And we've joked a number of times of, of, of uh, Ecclesiastes being the most depressing book in the entire Bible. And the questions that he has brought forward have been real questions. And now on this summary slide in the final three chapters, he, he moves to the place where he is telling us some of these final points of wisdom. He's going to encourage us to trust God. He's going to encourage us to be diligent and to work. He's going to encourage us here over the next couple chapters to accept what God has given. The lot in life that you have and that I have is the lot in life that God has given to us. Don't try to escape what God has, has provided and given to you. And he's going to move to that place of, of really bringing us down to the core of what life is all about, being thankful, enjoying it to the fullness, full, full, fullness of it, not foolishness of it, the fullness of it, and worshiping and serving God in all that your life entails. Now that's, that is, that's quite an action-packed summary there in, in uh, we won't be able to digest all of that tonight, but in a very um, topical way, uh, we are going to navigate through three, four, five, maybe even six little tiny points here tonight. So point number one, it starts off with protection. Protection. This is verses one through four. Uh, one more time, verse one, he says, dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. And so does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. You will remember with me all the way back in chapter 7, verse 1, that he used the picture of ointment right there. And he said that a good name is better than precious ointment. And, and, and so this contrast that he made back in, in chapter 7, and as he carries the picture, the imagery, the illustration of this again, first thing we know that, that man, when, when you read that verse, it captures your senses. Because I don't know if you've ever, you know, if you've ever um, had a piece of uh, food or a drink where all of a sudden you found like there was a hair or a bug or something in it. What, what's the, ta uh, the flavor that goes through your mind at that point? Hmm, I'm not sure where that bug came from. <laughs> you know, that's kind of gross. And, and so with this little picture here, dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment. Man, that illustration, that little picture captures your senses just like that. Whoa, what is he talking about? He pulls you right in with this, this imagery, if you will. And then he, he narrows it down and he says, so does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. Wow. Now, I've walked with Jesus for 26 years. Some of you have heard me tell this story or parts of my story. But in, in my first handful of years of walking with Jesus, I was 20 got saved right there, right, right at 21 years old. And man, my life was a wreck before I came to Jesus. It was just, it was, I mean, you know, socially, I, you look at me and I, well, he's fine, okay. But, but internally and practically and morally, I was stinking bankrupt. I had a lot of challenges, okay. And my first three, four, five years of walking with Jesus was absolutely disgusting. Now, for a, a, a natural man, a carnal man, a person that's not a Christian, when they turn 21, what are some of the great celebrations that go on as a kid? And you're turning 21 years old. Oh, I can drink now. Okay, well, this is right around the time of me becoming a Christian, okay? And, and uh, you know, sad to say, I didn't wait till 21 to drink. I think I started doing that like at 10. Uh, and I'm not kidding, no hyperbole there. And so my, 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 my point to you is, is nothing more than this is that there was a, a, a time in my early Christian walk here where I was around a circle of, of friends and they knew that I had gotten saved and they knew I was claiming the name of Jesus and they knew I would come around to the social engagements to represent and to tell them about Jesus and to invite them to church. But with that, that new reputation that I was a follower of Christ, they found it a challenge to pull me off of my stool, right? Okay, here it is, I'm sitting on the Jesus stool. Uh, you guys have seen us do this thing before. If I was to stand up on top of this swiveling stool right here, 
and I grab hold of Ian's hand, who's going to win the battle? My little feet together on a swiveling stool. Ian's taking me down, right? Okay, he's pulling me off of this stool. And that's what would happen. That's happened to me many times. And it's like, I got the name of a Christian and I'm trying to figure it out and trying to walk it out. But you know what? In those early days of my Christian walk, shipwreck, bam, oh, I got sucked right back into doing that which I shouldn't do. And when a person is respected for wisdom and they give way to a little folly, oh no, it's not so good. It's, it's like the prefer, perfumer's ointment. Can't get that word out tonight, okay? It gives off a foul odor, like a dead fly within that ointment. And so you get the picture of the disgustingness of that. It shouldn't be. Light cannot mix with darkness, right? You know, what communion does light have with darkness? Paul tells us it doesn't exist. It should not be. We should come out and be separate amongst them. Verse number two, he says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Now, this is not an underhanded maneuver of saying that a left-handed person is a bad person, okay? That's not what it is. But in the book of Psalms, we need to remember and, and to recognize that a right-handed person or, 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 or getting that right hand, it was a picture of protection. Psalm 110, verse 5. Psalm 121, verse 5. All of these bring the shrouding in the picture of protection. And he says, a wise man's heart is at his right hand. A wise man keeps his heart protected. But the fool... What is, where is his heart? His heart is on the left hand. And that is a picture of being exposed, exposed to unnecessary risk. Uh, Jesus would tell us this in the Gospel of Matthew. I'll just read it to you. Don't, don't turn there. Uh, Matthew 25, verse number 33, he would say, Jesus speaking, he says, He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left and so the only thing that Solomon is doing by making the distinction here with the right hand and the left hand is speaking about a place of protection versus a place of being exposed. Very simple wisdom that comes through this. Verse number three, he says, even when a fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom. And he shows everyone that he is a fool. So it's amazing here that, that even though you might be able to try to communicate to uh, a fool in this case, okay? Hey, this is the way that you can do it. And yet they don't grasp and they don't understand the aspects of wisdom. And I would say that for us, you know, if we could remember what Paul talks about in the book of Romans, Romans 6 and 21, he would talk about our old lives, the things that we've done in our old lives, that there was no fruit in it. And in, in the things that have gone on in our old life, that we're ashamed to even talk about some of those things. But a fool, when he walks along, he doesn't recognize that he even lacks wisdom and he's always yielding and he's always entertaining those things that are destructive to him. And so our, our, our first point of application, I think, that I'd like to extend to us tonight is three simple safeguards. And I want you to do the Bible Olympics with me, okay? I'm going to give us three simple safeguards. I want you to, to, to spring over with me to the New Testament, to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, we know that this is, um, you know, it, 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 it's a picture of the characteristics of the old life and the new life. And all the way down in verse number 15, after Paul has gone through a series of things about Christian living, about what to put off and what to put on, he comes down to verse number 15 as like, a, as like almost like a capstone on his section. And he says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. So the first little safeguard here that I want to make sure that we understand is that as it comes to living our daily life, as it comes to making decisions, as it comes to uh, even growing up in Jesus, right? The, 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 we we want to have the presence and the peace of the Holy Spirit ruling and reigning within our life. Now hear me out, Christian, on this, okay? Here are the technicalities behind this. Because we have a Greek word here for rule. I've mentioned this in this fellowship a number of times. I'm just going to give it to you by way of reminder one more time. And that is this rule. 
This means that the Holy Spirit becomes the deciding factor, that the Holy Spirit literally becomes the umpire in, in helping you to make the decisions and to make the directional chorus change, okay? So, so listen, think about your life right now. What decisions are you navigating through? You know, I, I sat in the back office today. I'm going, well, what decisions am I in the middle of? And, and, and suddenly I came up with a list of all kinds of things that are on my mind that I literally have to make decisions over. Things with my family, things with the fellowship here, things with even my own personal situations and all that. The, the decisions that are there. And, and one of the things that we want to make sure to put in place as a safeguard to live a, you know, we talk about living a spirit-filled life. Well, well, the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, that the peace of God would rule and reign within our heart, that the peace of God would become the referee when we make decisions. Now, I can try to encapsulate all this stuff into words and to share with you the words, but I can't give you the experience. But if you're a Christian and you walk with the Lord, you know very well that when you get off base, that there's a check in your spirit, that you have that void of peace. And this is what we're talking about, that, that, that we want the peace of God to rule and reign within our hearts so that we know that the chorus and the steps that we are taking are the right steps because we have the witness of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can bypass the witness of the Holy Spirit. How so? By not paying attention. How does the Spirit speak? We have the picture in the Old Testament, right? It, it's that gentle whisper. It's that small, delicate voice. We know that. And you're not crazy, okay? I, I often wrestle with myself in my early days of being a Christian. It's like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'm just thinking about that Bible verse. Well, no, you would have never thought about that Bible verse unless God was speaking to you in the moment. God was trying to bring a scripture to your mind in the moment that he might direct your footsteps. And that's part of the peace of God. And we yield to, to him by faith. Second safeguard is this. Uh, turn with me now to your left to the book of Psalms, Psalm 43. Uh, for those of you that are visiting here on Wednesday night, uh, we take a decidedly different chorus to our Wednesday night study than we do on our Sunday morning study. And so we're more hands-on here on our Wednesday night, okay? So Psalm 43, uh, verse number three. It says this, O oh, send out your light and your truth, exclamation mark. This is, there's some emphasis behind that. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. The idea about this or the idea behind this is, is that it's, it's, it's God's word leading us into God's presence. And, and, and that is one way that we should be walking so that we don't find ourselves engaging in folly, foolishness, moving to a place of, of just, oh man, I blew it again. Well, how can I not blow it again? Well, by, by understanding that it, when we have God's word, we allow God's word to shape our decisions. Yes, in moment by moment, but also the big decisions. We've got the peace of the Holy Spirit giving us that inner check and we have the voice of God speaking to us. Then we have it confirmed through the word of God. It's God's very word that becomes a light to us that, that literally here, as the psalmist is crying out, he says, let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill. And that, that merely means is into God's presence. And we often talk about, well, hey, as you go out and you do your business on a day-by-day -day thing, be in God's presence. Well, how do I, how am I in God's presence? It's God's word. It's by remembering what he says and letting him speak to you in the moment in the things that you are doing. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You know, I, I've not always been a pastor. I, I you know, I've, I started off, you know, in, in that, you know, 20 year, uh, 20 year old young man before I got saved in, in the law enforcement community as a cop. And I spent seven years in that. It didn't go well for me, okay? Uh, because it made my heart harder and harder and harder and God wanted me to do this. And then I spent some time in the real estate industry for about 15 years or so. And boy, that was up and down. I tell you, when it was feast, it was feast. But when famine was happening, I wanted to be in Eskimo and move to Alaska because it was so painful, right? Um, but, but, but real things have gone on, and, and in the middle of my daily life, I haven't got it all right. But one thing's for certain is with every passing year, I've learned how to follow Jesus more and more and more, 
And these are the simple truths that I pass to you tonight, is that, that you in your individual life would learn how to follow Jesus more and more, and that your life would blossom, and that you'd be abundantly fruitful for Christ, not in the back of the church doing jumping jacks because I just gotta serve Jesus harder, but being fruitful in your decisions, in your walk, in having the peace of God, in his very presence in all of your circumstances that you're walking through. All right, let's go to the third and final one here regarding the safeguards, okay? First one was the Holy Spirit as a referee and, and literally you know, remaining in his peace. Second one was the word of God shaping our very decisions. And the third one is this, is the, the counsel of God. You know, we're getting counsel from God's people. They keep us accountable. Uh, Proverbs, what is it? Uh, chapter 11. Proverbs 11, I think it's 11. I could be wrong. Uh, 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 yes, Proverbs 11 and 14. It says this. It says, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. The people literally fall. They go away to settle in to a failed state. The idea behind this Hebrew word for fall is that the person gives up. Where there's no counsel, the people fall. They literally give up. But in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. There's, there's literally, there's deliverance. And it's so powerful because this uh, Hebrew word for safety here in this verse, why it talks about deliverance, watch, listen, listen to me, Christian. Listen to me, Bible students. While it talks about deliverance, the deliverance is coming through the human agency of a fellow person that is providing the counsel. And the steps of safety that we're talking about here, the safeguards, so that we don't find ourselves lingering in foolishness. What happens in Vegas? Vegas. Sinners. Okay, yes, that's true. That's the statement is true, right? Okay, but, but so that we don't find that taking place, here's the simple steps. Again, the Holy Spirit is a referee. God's word shapes our decisions and it's the counsel of God's people that keeps us accountable and also keeps us encouraged. Why? Because when we look around and we see a brother or a sister that they're, they're downcast, what do we do? Well, our tendency is to go over them. Hey, what's going on, man? How can I pray for you? What can I do to help you? All of these things are the simple things of us giving and taking. Um, over the weekend, we talked about fellowship and I mentioned that fellowship is a two-way street, the giving and the taking. Okay, and, and that's all part of fellowship. And so three little safeguards there. Flip back to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Now we come to verse number four. And here at verse number four, still within this section of folly, the folly takes on a new little face here though. It says this, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post for conciliation pacifies great offenses. If the spirit of the ruler rises against you, this particular foolishness here, this is an example of hasty emotional decisions. That when our emotions get in there and we get riled up and we get frustrated and we get whatever we want to get and, and somebody gives us something and we want to blast off with, with an emotional response, well, let's, let's shade it in uh, maybe something practical, something that you've done before, okay? Or, or maybe you've experienced it to a, a lower degree. You're at work and you got a boss that's just a knucklehead, okay? Your boss is irritating and, they, and you know plain and simple that they shouldn't even be the boss. And yet, they are the boss. They're the ones that allow you to be where you're at. And in a moment of great hotness and being ticked off, you, you just say, forget it, pal. You throw the pin at them, you walk out the door or something like that. You know? Uh, you know, just getting so frustrated over something. Listen, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post. Now, I wish I would have known this as a teenager because I would have lost a whole fewer jobs. I would have walked away from a whole lot less jobs at that as a teenager. I didn't have wisdom. I was a fool walking around, and I made it known that I was a fool just by the way that I lived. But these are real things that come to us. Well, let's apply it to the church, okay? Let's get an application within the church. Wait a minute. I don't like what my ministry leader has to tell me. I don't like what the overseers of the church are saying. I don't like what the assistant pastor has said. Oh, I don't even like what the pastor said. That guy's such a knucklehead. Listen, the scripture would tell us and give us this counsel here in this 
in this section of folly, in this section of foolishness, that if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post. Now, I'm counting all your faces here tonight, and the camera sees you. Not really, it doesn't, but okay. But this is, a, this is, a, this is wisdom for us, gang. This is total wisdom for us. Because how many people have you heard through the course of time of you being a part of the body of Christ or around work, or around ministry, whatever, and you hear people get ticked off and what do they do? They storm out the back door. There are a bunch of jerks there. What does the Bible tell you to do? Stay put. Stay put. Now, now we get into 2018. Now we bring our national uh, time, um, time stamp to it. Now we bring our own individual cultural time print to it, to whatever your family background is and all this stuff. Ain't nobody telling me what to do. Okay, fine. Then in, indulge in a little folly and stomp off and walk out the back door. But it's going to be harmful for you because once you leave, your, leave the nest that you're in, so to speak, Proverbs addresses this. It's like a bird that wanders from his nest. You know, a little bird wandering from his nest, they become vulnerable to be picked off. You know, in my neighborhood right now, in my section of town over here on the east side of Thornton out there, 128th all the way down at the end, that we've got this, this uh, app. Uh, help me out if I'm saying this the word the right way. The neighborhood app, is that what it's called? In our neighborhood. There's this neighborhood app, and when you, when you move into the neighborhood, you get on it, and they, I don't know how they verify you are who you are, but you're a part of the app, and you see all the discourse that's going on in your neighborhood. Well, today, somebody has created a riot because somebody ran over a goose on the road last night. <laughs> How do you hit a 20-pound goose? I don't know. I don't even know if they're 20 pounds. A big old gigantic bird. Somebody ran the bird over. Now people are having a cow, okay? You know, and, they, and somebody had put up these little road signs, you know, duck crossings, be cautious, be careful. Uh, literally, this has been going on. It's, it's drama in my neighborhood for the past month or so. Well, the birds have gone from these little things to a much bigger thing, and somebody squat, squished the goose last night. Or the, what? Okay, what's my point? like a bird that wanders from his nest. That's the point. That's the Proverbs, okay? You're going to get squished. And, 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 and when you get squished, it's because you've engaged in something that has gone contrary to wisdom and you've engaged in foolishness or folly. Listen, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, hold your post. Don't leave your post. For conciliation pacifies great offense. Calmness and yielding is what it means. Conciliation, calmness and yielding. Hold your post. I think that's a good bit of wisdom that we could use. Uh, all right, point number two. Oh, my goodness. Time flies so fast. We only made it for two. Okay. These are supposed to be short. I don't know what happens here. <laughs> that's what happens. Okay, point number two. Wrong choices. Verses five through seven. He says, There is an evil I have seen under the sun, as an heir proceeding from the ruler. Now notice the punctuation, colon, Folly is set in great dignity, why the rich sit in a lowly place. I have seen servants on horses, why princes walk on the ground like servants. Wrong choices. This is, this is all about bad decisions and bad leadership, you know, and we're going to see this happen. And, and, and I want to give you... Um, I want to give you some shaping, I guess, from the scriptures, you know, regarding the church and all that. Because... In wrong decisions, there are people that actually get into leadership roles that should never be in leadership roles. So flip with me to the New Testament, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'll take you highlighting a little bit here. Um, let's go down to verse 22, okay? Because we know that be the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Uh, we know that uh, these are the nuts and bolts of church order, of church life, and all that stuff. And so we know that, that Paul was writing, young Timothy. Uh, and there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of different counsel throughout these things. But down in verse 22, he says to Timothy, he says, Listen, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Second thing that he gives here in verse 24. He says, some men's sins are clearly evident preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. They, they literally, they follow behind them. That they're, they'll be exposed in time and they come. I like to call this the, the right step at the right time. 
And then he gives us verse number 25. One more thing here and we'll, do, we'll break it down. He says, likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. This is practical help for us to be able to appoint leaders. Yes, there's qualifications in chapter 3. Yes, there's qualifications for church leadership over, even over in Titus. But, but, but some of the basic steps, some of the things that go on is, is that he's talking about, listen, take your time and do this. Don't make a wrong choice because you're doing it too fast. Take your time. And even in the aspect of taking times and not laying hands on somebody right away, unless you share in the folly or the sins of somebody else, unless you become responsible for that decision and all the, the downfall that happens, he says, go slow about this thing. Now, let's talk real for a second, okay? Uh, keep your Bible right there, but after you're done taking a note or so, look up at me, okay? Making fast decisions. I'm wired in such a way as, uh, you know, some, some have said I have that, uh, there's a real thing out there, hand, foot, and mouth disease. You know, I think Peter had it, right? You know, it, it's, like, uh, it's like fire, ready, aim. Oh, wait a minute, did I just do that backwards? You know, yes, right, it's ready, aim, fire, okay? In, in the aspect of, of choosing people and not being hasty, not, not, not having this undue speed about making selection processes, this is something that we have taken quite literally at this fellowship. We've only had on-site elder, deacon, leadership roles here for about a year in this church. Okay, we, we spent the first six years surveying and waiting and testing and seeing who God would identify before those appointments came. And then once our eyes were set on, uh, you know, some people, a handful of men, then we even, you know, I sat down with, with a group of guys three years ago and I said, actually it's been more than three years now, four years ago now. And I said, you know, I said, even though you're saying that you want to do X, Y, and Z and you want to be here and, you're, and God has called you and all this stuff, I said, I'm not going to really know you until we've been through some real battle together. I, I, until we've really been engaged into where we've got to get each other's back and that we've got to move beyond our emotions and yield to what the scripture has to say. And gang, this is why showing up to church is so hugely important. Because you can watch from home, and I'm not dissing you guys that are watching online. <laughs> We're glad you're there. Good to, good to, I can't see you. I'd say good to see you. I can't see you, okay? But I'm glad you're there, Okay. But this is why coming to church is so important, right? Fellowship is a two-way street. It's a giving and a, and a receiving, right? A giving and a take. And you never know what's, what's going on with your own little heart until you're stepped on by somebody else. I, until you collide with somebody else, just in, not necessarily a servant or a ministry leader or the pastor or something like that, but until you collide with somebody else. Somebody walks out of the bathroom and leaves the door to close on your face. You, you know, how do you feel about that? Somebody takes the last bit of coffee and looks at you and turns around, bumps you, and then the coffee spills on you. How do you respond? You, you really see where your heart is at that particular moment. And these are the only things that can be developed by having the close proximity of relationship. So too with the leadership selection of people. To raise up, it takes time to go through battle to make the selections. There were those folks that were here and maybe still are here uh, that were frustrated. And it's like, well, why are you so slow to appoint leadership? Here's why. Because I'm brand new to this town and I'm bad, brand new to the relationships and going through this town and the relationships, it takes time to be built. Sorry. Time. We've got to see what that looks like. It said this about leaders, that the best leaders are tough-minded but tender-hearted. Think about King David. The dude was straight up a warrior. Mm -hmm. If you cross him, dude would probably cut your head off, okay? That's just him. And yet he had a heart after God. Did we get that? He was a tough-minded, but he had that heart that was still tender-hearted. Yeah, David wasn't a perfect man. He blew it in all kinds of things, right? But he still had that tender heart to come back to the Lord. And I want to encourage you guys to understand this from a practical level, that, that we're in, still in this wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes as we're making the wind down and we're kind of teaching through it in incremental phases because it's a whole lot like Proverbs in parts, right? And, and, and we're, we're just absorbing the incremental wisdom that is there. And part of this incremental wisdom is, is that understanding folly. And in the middle of folly, 
Well, there's all kinds of things. I've got to flip back to the text because I'm losing my brain here. Okay, there it is. In the middle of folly, um, which is the whole chapter, he says, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, all of these things. He says this, uh, verse 5, he says, this is an evil I have seen under the sun as an heir proceeding from the ruler. So the decision aspect that was made, people were appointed to positions that should have never had a leadership position. The wrong choices. Now we move to point number three, unbecoming behavior. Verses eight and nine. He says, he who digs a pit will fall into it. And whoever breaks through a, a wall will be bitten by a serpent. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them. He who splits wood may be endangered by it. Very interesting. Unbecoming behavior. Listen, for a Christian, bad behavior is often the result of a neglected relationship with Jesus. And serving in the church, what does it require? It requires a servant heart. Why? Well, I've, I've highlighted it a little bit, but let me magnify it a little bit more. And the reason that it requires a servant heart is because you're going to hear and you're going to see all the frailties of somebody else. Listen, listen to me, Christian. If you're in the place of serving from your own strength, from your own natural abilities, or you're doing it out of a grudging obligation because of a ministry person or the pastor or some overseer has encouraged you or you, know, you may feel like they're voluntolding you, squishing you, serve, serve, serve. If you're doing it from a grudging capacity, or if you're doing it even out of a blind routine, well, this is what I signed up for. I just got to go through this mindless motion of doing this stuff. You are going to get squished like a bug. Why? Well, because you're going to start digging pits for other people. Ha! Did you see what that guy did? And you're going to you know, start murmuring. You're gonna start, it starts in your heart, the little murmur. And then that murmur is going to turn into a gossip. And you're going to begin to verbalize that to somebody else. And it's going to spill out all over the place. And then you're going to try to step into something you shouldn't be in. And just like putting your hand through a wall, you're going to be bitten by a serpent. Because someone's going to tell you, uh, what are you doing? And you're going to have a cow. You're just going to flip out. If you're serving under the wrong intentions. If you're doing it according to your natural abilities and not God's Holy Spirit. If there's not the prayerful dependence upon the Holy Spirit to serve. Years ago, 15 years ago now. I cannot believe how time has passed so fast. That... You know, my, some of my first experiences of serving in ministry, God took me through the ringer and turned my life upside down, and I needed it. I needed to go through all the hardship that he put me through 15 years ago out of uh, Calvary Chapel, Castle Rock. I had to go through all of that. It was good. But I, I will tell you that, that the practices that God put within my heart at that time and the practices that I do to this present hour up to and including moments before I, I come out here to share God's word, is that the reliance upon the Holy Spirit. I am looking to God to help me. I am just a man. And as a man, I can be a bumbling fool all over the place. You may still interpret me as a bumbling fool. <laughs> but there's something powerful that is laced behind the bumbling fool. And that is the work of God's Holy Spirit. And I learned this years ago. That when I was driving to church, uh, sometimes I would come as a, we would come as a family. Other times, because I was required to be there at like 6.30 in the morning. I would be there before the family. But on the way to church, every time, I would be praying and asking God to fill me up to overflowing with His Holy Spirit. Literally, this was the whole drive all the way to church. You know, my drive was only about 15 minutes, so it was pretty short. But I'd be asking God for that power, that when I came in to the fellowship and I came into the doors to serve other people, I was just a volunteer, that I would have the capacity and the wherewithal of God to love others, to accept them, to embrace them, and to even pastor them. And I wasn't a pastor then. I was just serving. I was just doing what I was doing, to have that servant's heart. And my encouragement to you is this, is that you wouldn't forget these things and that you would, you would do them as well. That you would rely upon the Lord so that you wouldn't move into this place of unbecoming behavior out of your natural abilities to where you dig pits for others and you get yourself in bad situations and you start stacking up stones to throw at somebody else and they end up falling on your own head and all of this stuff. Well, we're going to have to move really fast now because it's 730. And I, I will sit here and teach you all night long, but I understand that now is the time I should be ending and uh, I was told this years ago that the mind can only endure, uh, only absorb, only absorb what the seat can endure. 
So maybe we should have intermission at church, and then we'll come back again. <laughs> that would be interesting, right? Okay, it's time for a break. <laughs> hey, you do it at college, right? You do it at work, you know? Well, let me blast through a couple points here real fast. Point number four is sharpen your axe. It's, it's out of verse number 10. You know, some of you will recall that scripture in Zechariah 4 and 6, that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What's the point? Listen. We can have a tremendous zeal for Jesus, but if we lack wisdom to walk with him, we miss it all, okay? And what would the Holy Spirit have us to do? Listen, if you're, if you're uh, the verse says, if the ax is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength, but wisdom brings success. So let us yield to wisdom. How so? Listen, if you're finding yourself getting run down and, and, and you're finding yourself moving to this place to where your own personal Uh, relation and devotional time with the Lord is growing dull and dry and distant maybe even. Okay, that's okay. Just be real about that, okay? Don't think that you're the only one that's got some strange plague. Well, my relationship with Jesus is on the rocks right now and my devos are just, I'm not hearing from the Lord. It's natural. It happens to everybody. Pastors go through it, you know, every day, sometimes twice on Sunday, even when they're sharing the word, okay? It's just real. It just happens. Be encouraged for this. Understand that it's okay to pull over and take a little, uh, what do they call those, a park and ride? Maybe we'll call it a park and rest, okay? To, to pull over to the side of the moment, catch your breath. It doesn't mean that you disappear for a year, but, but it might mean that you, oh, hey man, take the weekend off. Look around. I did something totally strategic this week, and I don't know if you noticed it. All of my family, actually, that's not even true. Half of my family, five of them are gone right now, okay? They're gone. I said, get out of here. We don't want you here. Ooh, we want them here, but because they're probably watching right now. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, what is the point behind that? I have no idea. Oh, if the axe is dull, that's the point. If the axe is dull, if you find yourself getting a little bit dull, hey man, just pull over. You know, you know, uh, spend some time. You know, maybe we would take the counsel of Acts. Uh, Paul gave to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter twenty, verse twenty-eight. You know, he, he said, take heed to yourself and the flock amongst you. I, I love the way the ESV puts it um, for Acts 20 and 28. Pay careful attention to yourself. You know, pay attention to yourself. If you find your tank is getting on empty, man, you need a refill. It may or may not mean time off. It, it may mean nothing more than you being refreshed by the Holy Spirit and maybe having somebody lay hands on you and receiving a fresh, you know, a bestowment of the Holy Spirit so that you can continue on or getting a good word, whatever it is. Um, but may we not become like Martha, though, so burdened and so busy and so distracted in the aspects of ministry. And, and, and I am wired like Martha because that's, that's my natural default. Uh, you know, some of you have had to come and tell me, hey, man, why don't you take a weekend off? We love you, but sure, we sure wish you'd be gone, you know, in, this, in the nicest of way. Um, he's not here tonight, and I'll just call him out. Larry tells me this, my brother Larry. He's been with me you know, for the longest time here. He speaks those words of truth to me. And I love it, and I need it, and I appreciate it, and they're good words. So when somebody gives you a good word, don't punch them in the eyeball. Just know they care for you. <laughs> Last two, super fast. Last two. Uh, point number five. I've never had this many points in a message, but we have them tonight, okay? Uh, talk is cheap, verses 11 to 15. He says, a serpent may bite when it is not charmed. Notice this right here, Okay. He gives us a semicolon, so he's going to give us something. The babbler is no different. What is he talking about? James 3, maybe? We can go to that aspect of dealing with the tongue. In fact, the Hebrew word for babbler right here in this section that we're looking at literally is tongue. And we know in the New Testament that we deal, how do we deal with the tongue? We see that in James chapter 3. I don't have time to give all the details uh, of James chapter 3, tonight, but I would encourage you to look at maybe verse 6 and maybe verses 13 through 15, and uh, maybe God will show you something powerful there. Uh, At the end of the day, talk is cheap, but our actions do speak louder than words. Now, if we go along with the wrong motivation, we've covered a few things along the way about the wrong motivation. But now we see the person's mouth, 11 through, down through 15. We see all of these things. And, and let's look at verse 15. It says, The labor of fools wearies them, for they do not even know how to go to the city. The end result of wrong motivation, the individual gives up. 
They just stop trying. Oh, I don't even know how to go to the city. Who cares? You know, maybe you'll remember the Proverbs. There's a lion in the streets. I can't go out there. They're always making excuses. The wrong motivation is going to always try to find a way out. They give up. Point number six, and our final point is actions. Dealing with verses 16 through 20. Uh, he gives us a, a crazy start here because verse 16 is the woe. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes a feast in the morning. So that's, that's the side that is lacking wisdom. That's the side that is lacking skill. That's the side that is lacking understanding. It's a woe. You know, when leadership is young and inexperienced, and, and, and what are they doing? They're feasting at the wrong time. Verse 17. But blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. There's a distinction. That the, that the woe is coming to those that were stepping into leadership and they were feasting for the aspect of taking advantage of resources and becoming pleasure-seeking drunkards, if you will. Whereas the second one, the blessed, this speaks of the nobility, speaking of a, of, of a son that was raised up and has heeded the aspect of wisdom. And we know that the aspect of wisdom was heated. Why? Because the proper use of the resources up to and including the nourishment is being taken in at the right time. It's not for pleasure. It's not for overindulgence. It's for, the, it's for strength to do what is right. Now he gives us verse number 18, which is a crazy example of these things. He says, because of laziness, the building decays and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. So we got using wisdom in the first part. What is that? One more time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie this back in one more time because I, I got a phrase here I want to give you. Some of the external signs of wisdom is upkeep and care. External. This is not a, uh, this is not a total say-all, okay? But an external sign of faithfulness of stewardship, faithfulness of stewardship can be external care, okay? The opposite side of that, verse 18, he gives us the laziness, how laziness is re revealed through a lack of upkeep and through a lack of care. So again, the external signs. We've got the woes, we've got the blessings, and, and, and we've got him, he's kind of pigeonholing these things in there, and, and he's using the illustration of a building. Proverbs uses the illustration of a wall and a field and all that. If the wall is toppled over and the field has all the weeds in it, you know, he passed by uh, and he gained instruction from that. Um, but, but here, we're using the external aspects of wisdom over folly. I hope that's understandable. 19 and 20 closes us out. It says, in 19, it says, A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. What in the world is that all about? All right, here it is, three things. Selfish pleasure, smoozing, and taking of bribes. Okay, that's the deal. That's the, but money answers everything. In other words, that the leader that was moving in this place of folly was only concerned about self-pleasure, self-smoothing, and getting the bribes to do whatever somebody else wanted them to do. And they would set these things up in days of antiquity. Very interesting the way that it worked. Last verse, our final. It says, do not curse the king even in your thoughts or your thought. You don't even have a, no, no thoughts, plural. It's only singular, thought. <laughs> don't curse the king in your thought. Uh, don't curse the rich even in your bedroom, for a bird of the air may carry your voice, and a bird in flight may tell the matter. Um, this one. We're to keep our motives pure. How? By releasing our frustrations to God in prayer. And then we won't find ourselves grumbling, murmuring, complaining, and doing all these stuff, whether it's in the quietness of our heart or in the secrecy of our bedroom, we're not going to do it. Why? Because we're rolling off the burdens onto the Lord. And God has called us to do that, to roll our burdens off onto Him. How do we do that? It's by way of prayer. We give the struggles, the irritations, the frustrations. You know, we, we, Jesus would tell us in the uh, Sermon on the Mount um, is that, that we're to pray for those that spitefully use us and persecute us. It's a prayer. We're rolling it off onto him. And so um, I'm going to have Alyssa come forward here now, but I'm going to leave you with an action item or, or something 
um, to walk out, okay? Here it is. Don't miss this. It's super simple. Uh, and that is, is, I want you to start a prayer list. And I want you to put five specific requests on it. You could be requesting salvation. You could be requesting deliverance. You could be you know, requesting whatever, whatever, whatever. But I want you to put today's date on it. I've got to put my watch out farther. July 18th, 2018. Put today's date on it. One, two, three. Now, I'm not going to see this list. But my encouragement to you is between now and the end of the year is that you would put these things down and you begin to consistently pray about these five things and watch what God does. Watch the faithfulness of God of how he either answers the prayer, sustains you in the middle of the request, or even changes your desire to pray for something a little bit different or you know, in a different way or something like that. What's my point behind all that? Man, I just want you to experience God. I want you to see how real our God is. And I, I was thinking about this um, uh, last night at home. Uh, you can kill the lights in the back. I literally was thinking about this. It's like, well, how can I encourage the fellowship, us as a fellowship, to see the faithfulness of our God? There's no better way than to write these things down, write our personal requests down, and watch God do the work in our lives. Amen? Let us stand and let us pray. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link at westminstercalvary.org. We also would like to invite you to join us for our regular weekly services on Sundays at 8.30 and 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are conveniently located on the northeast corner of Wadsworth Parkway and Church Ranch Boulevard in the Stanley Lake Marketplace Shopping Center. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless. Oh